Well, good morning, everyone. And I'm um, proud to have been a member of the Pickauer Institute for the past 20 years. And I think with generous support from Barbara and Jeffrey Pickauer, and also from, from uh, a lot of help from a lot of very talented young scientists, I think we've made, we've accomplished a lot. So my lab uh, studies memory and executive brain functions. These are the brain functions that do the thinking. Things like attention, working memory, rule learning, categories and concepts, much like Susumu talked about. And the way we study them is we record electrical signals from the brain. And then we use math, computational modeling, and analytics to make sense of these signals. Now, why do we do this? Well, we want to figure out cognition and how the brain works. That's cool. That's fun. That's great. But also, and importantly, we want to figure out cognitive dysfunction in diseases so we can open up new paths to therapies. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work today, but I thought for this occasion, I should give you a little bit of context. Because if you want to know um, what, how neuroscience has changed in the past 20 years and how the Pickauer Institute has helped bring about that change, I think it's important to understand where we came from. So way back in the 20th century, when I was a graduate student, we used to think about the brain very differently. We thought about the brain as kind of being like a clock, clockwork. It was a collection of specialized parts, and each part had one function and one function only. So here's the parts, the gears. These are neurons, individual brain cells. They signal by, by giving off electrical impulses, also known as action potentials. We also call them spikes. And here's how we used to study the brain back in the 20th century. Due to technological limitations, also our own lack of knowledge, we used to study neurons one at a time, individually. So this is from the groundbreaking Nobel Prize winning work of Hubel and Wiesel. What they were doing is they were trying to figure out how vision works. And they recorded neurons in the back of the brain in the visual cortex where the first stage of visual processing is going on. And what did they find? They found individual cells seem to break down the visual scene into low-level visual features. So this example here, this particular neuron in the visual cortex activates spikes whenever the animal sees a line of a particular orientation at a particular location on the retina. So this, this neuron is detecting an edge of a particular orientation and location. This is this neuron's one and only function. Its job, its job, did my mic suddenly go down? OK. Um, this is, was its one and only function. That's all it did. Its job was to detect that particular edge at that location. And of course, um, other neurons spike the edges at other orientations and locations, and that's how vision works. Everything is all put together, and then you have vision. And these other neurons that respond to other edges, that's their function. They have other functions. So that's how the parts. What about how do the parts work together? Well, according to the 20, 20th century model of how the brain works, neurons, like gears, work because they're physically connected. In other words, Neurons combine their signals because they're wired together. And here's how this works. Here's our edge detectors back in visual cortex. They're all detecting edges at different orientations and different locations. And then the next stage of processing, a neuron combines the signal output of two, two of these edge detectors and detects a longer edge. Then you put other edges together, and you, get, you combine their signals, and you get to corner detectors that detect corners. And then you combine, 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 further and further processing. And eventually, you get the complex shapes, neurons that will detect and activate the complex shapes. And there's lots and lots of neurons in your brain, so you combine enough, combine, combine. And eventually, you get the peace, love, and understanding. This is how we thought the brain used to work. All this simple neurons doing one thing and combining their signals. But now we think of the brain as much more complex and dynamic. And I'll get to that in a moment. But first. What changed? Well, what changes advances in tech. First of all, what changes is we, under we understand more about the brain now, so we can ask more detailed, complicated questions. But also, there's advances in technology. Multiple electrode recording, imaging allowed us to record the signals not from one neuron one at a time, but from hundreds to thousands to millions of neurons. Or things that change is tools that turn on and off neurons and networks in the working brain, like optogenetics. You can actually manipulate the circuits or closed-loop stimulation like we're, we're using. And 
there was a rise of computational neuroscience. These are mathematical tools and theoretical analysis of how actually networks of things work together. Not how individual parts work, but how all these parts work together. And as a result, so now instead of studying parts, we now can watch networks work and we can manipulate them. We can start studying the brain in a more holistic fashion. That's what the 21st century has brought us. And as a result, there's been a shift to focus on emergent properties. These are properties and mechanisms that emerge only when the parts interact as part of a greater whole. You can't see these emergent properties one part at a time. You can see all the parts working together. And I'll get to an example of emergent property in just a moment. But before then, let me take you back about 22 years or so when, the, um, when I was a member of the Center for Learning and Memory and the Pick Our Institute was just coming about. And we wanted to ask a question in the lab about how the brain makes concepts. In other words, I showed you examples of little edge detectors that break down the visual scene into little tiny parts. We wanted to go beyond that and say, how does all this put together? How does the brain ignore these details of low-level features and put, get the big picture, big concepts, just like the kind of stuff Sumo was talking about? So we did a series of investigations where we taught animals shape categories, like cats versus dogs. We taught animals to recognize small numbers, one through five. And, and they had to recognize the number. It doesn't, make different, it doesn't matter how we present the number. They had to tell us what that number was. And we even taught animals abstract principles, like same versus different and up versus down. And what we found across all these studies, we, we studied the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain right behind your forehead. It's the part of the brain that does the high-level thinking. It's the brain's executive, quote unquote. And we found that. Neurons in the prefrontal cortex activated, spiked, not to low-level visual features or details. They spiked to these concepts. They seem to represent these concepts. And that started a long line of investigation where we've been studying how the prefrontal cortex uses this big picture knowledge to exert executive control over thought and action. So that's all well and fine, but then it raised a problem for the old clockwork paradigm. Uh, we use new technology to now record from 10 times or even 100 times as many neurons as people have done in the past, and we could sample them more randomly than they've ever been done before. So we could try to get a true picture of what the population of neurons were doing. And what we found is that we found these effects in 30 to 40% of neurons in the prefrontal cortex and other high, higher cortical areas. 40%, that's a lot of neurons. It's like, it's like the past took over the brain. Right? How can this be? How can 40% of your neurons in higher cortex be doing just this one thing you trained the animal to do? This is a problem for the clockwork paradigm because the clockwork paradigm predicts a very different picture. Namely, you'll have a diverse group of specialized neurons. There might be some neurons that represent these concepts, but they'll be few in number and they'll be part of a whole specialization of other neurons that are all specialized for different things. The clockwork paradigm in the 20th century did not predict large population neurons that seemed to have the same function. So about 20 years ago, John Duncan and I first proposed that the answer to this is that Cortical neurons don't actually have one function. We've been thinking about the brain wrong. Neurons aren't, aren't single function, they're multifunctional. They're like utility players on a baseball team. They're a jack of all trades. They can do this, they can do that, they can do a whole bunch of different things. And if that's true, then it's not a big deal that the 40% of the neurons are doing this one task because they're also free to do other things at other, other times. Now, when John Duncan and I first presented this, we got a little bit of skepticism, a little bit of ridicule because it sort of flew in the face of the dominant paradigm. We were accused of turning the cortex into a bowl of porridge. We were told that we should go back to the laboratory because we weren't clever enough. If we were smart enough, we could figure out what these neurons are doing. We, we wouldn't come to these erroneous conclusions. But I'm happy to say we did a whole body of work for you know, 20 years or so, and other people started to do similar work, and everybody kept coming up with the same answer. Lots of neurons in the higher cortex doing the same thing. And then we went further than that, and we trained animals to perform multiple tasks, like two or three or four tasks, and we could actually track the same neuron doing different things in different tasks, switching its function from task to task. And now, the idea that multifunctional neurons exist in the brain is widely accepted. And one of, the reasons, one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons it's widely accepted now, in addition to the experimental work, is that uh, with my colleagues Stefano Fusi and Mattia Rigatti from Columbia University, we showed, they showed mathematically that you need this multifunctionality. Multifunctionality neurons are critical for higher cognitive functions and intelligent behavior because yeah, they add extra horsepower to the brain. What they are is like a neural bazaar where a wide range of information can all intermingle in the same population of neurons. And that's important because much of human behavior is completely arbitrary. 
we put arbitrary things together like green means go and red means stop. So there's got to be somewhere in the brain where these things can connect up as we make new rules and go about through life. Um, it also makes the brain smarter because it creates this high dimensional representational space where the brain can solve more complex problems than it can with, with specialized neurons. It also increases storage capacity for a whole bunch of mathy reasons I won't go into right now. But this neural bazaar also allows faster learning and flexibility because all the information is essentially there, this population of neurons at the brain's fingertips. Things can be learned really quickly and you, you have a lot of flexibility in what, what, what you're going to think about and what you're going to put together. And lear fast learning and flexibility is what cognition is all about. So now this idea of mixed selectivity and multifunctional neurons is it's, it's wi widely accepted. So that's fine. But that created another problem for the old clockwork paradigm, the 20th, 20th century paradigm. According to the clockwork paradigm, anatomy is destiny. It, neurons combine their signals because they are wired together. The idea was that every perception, thought, and action has an anatomically unique network, an ensemble. So here's our one thought here. There's a unique network for this one thought. Here's another thought. The red thought we'll call this, there's a, there's a unique network for that. Now you could like learn associations between things like if uh, between dinner bell and, and dinner. Um, and you might form associations between these networks or en ensembles. But generally, each, each unique thought was thought to have a unique network all anatomically unique to itself, right? Well, the problem is that multifunctional means that Neurons aren't specialized, they're members of multiple networks. So it means that the brain doesn't work like this, it works more like this. So here's our two networks now, and they share a common element, these multifunctional mixed selectivity neurons. And this is just two, your brain probably has like dozens if not hundreds of networks all interconnected with common elements. So if that's the case, if anatomy is destiny, how does this work? If I want to activate the red thought here in the red network, and if anatomy is everything, when I activate the red network, the activity will run through these multifunctional neurons to the blue network, and now you have two networks or more networks activated, and your brain has a mush of thoughts all colliding together. So it can't be anatomy alone. So what is it? How does the brain do this? Well, the answer that many of us have come to, that the solution is brain waves. Brain waves are, are synchronized activity of millions of neurons oscillating together. Now you're probably all familiar with brain waves. If you record e, e from the scalp using EEG electrodes, you'll see these squiggly lines operating at different frequencies from one time a second to 30 times a second or more. And these brain waves are, they track cognitive function or track consciousness. If you're awake and alert, you get higher frequency brain waves. When you start to fall asleep, they get slower. And if they ever go flat, you're in a lot of trouble. You don't want that. So what brain waves are, are they're an emergent property. They're a product of crowds of millions of neurons activating together, not individual voices. So here's a crowd doing the wave in the stadium. You see the wave moving from right to left. Now let's say I wanted to study this crowd using the old fashioned 21st century way of using a single neuron to study an individual in the crowd. I would stick a microphone to one person in this crowd and I would hear what they were saying and I would hear them shouting occasionally, but I would have no idea this larger structure is going on. I only could tell the larger structure by studying a whole bunch of neurons together and see this emergent property of how they interact, right? So now we come to realize that your brain kind of works like FM radio. Brain waves are a backbone of, of communication in cortex. So the way it works is you have what networks in the brain do, they, they do their own way. So here's our two uh, networks, all having common anatomical elements, but now these two networks can differentiate themselves, have create different engrams because they're they, they sync to their, their, their components in different ways. One network syncs the red neurons, sync to their, their other red neurons, and the blue neurons sync to other blue neurons using different dynamics, different patterns of synchrony. So the way to think about it is that neurons that hum together temporarily wire together. And what this buys you is cognitive flexibility. Networks can be formed and changed. You can change your mind from moment to moment. You can change what you're thinking about from moment to moment. You can change your goal, change, make it do something different on the fly. How, and and that anatomy alone can't explain that. It takes a long time to rewire your brain. But with these patterns of oscillatory resonance helping to form these ensembles, 
you can, you can change your mind as quickly as changing these patterns of resonance. So it buys you flexibility, which is what high-level cognition and intelligence is all about. So the way to think about it is that brain anatomy is not destiny. It's possibility. Brain anatomy is kind of like the road and highway system. It just says where traffic could go. Where traffic does go is determined by the brainwave patterns. They direct the traffic. They determine where the traffic goes from moment to moment on this backdrop of anatomy. Now, I'm not saying anatomy is important. Anatomy is all the latent knowledge built into your brain that can be drawn upon. But what determines your thoughts from moment to moment are these, uh, how the traffic moves along these anatomical pathways determined by these uh, patterns of brainwave synchrony. So once we came to this realization, we went back over our previous work where we studied categories and concepts. We did many new experiments. And every time we taught the animal something new, some new category, some new concept, new principle, we saw different patterns of brainwave synchrony, synchrony for them. So this hypothesis has borne out over multiple, multiple experiments. We even found, more recently, that different brainwave frequencies carry different types of information, like different, different stations on, on the FM radio dial. So for example, we find uh, that higher frequencies, brain waves of 30 hertz and above, 30 times in a second and above, they traffic sensory information from the back of your brain where it's analyzed forward to the front of your brain, more, the more executive parts of your brain. So they, that, that's, how, that's how sensory information gets to the front of your brain, on the, riding on these high frequency brain waves. At the same time, your executive parts of the brain send control signals, top-down signals via lower frequency brain waves below 30 hertz, and they help control, they allow the brain to control its own processing. And we think that, um, that uh, this is how attention works, this is how you control your own thoughts, this is how you can regulate sensory processing, and this imbalance between these two signals could create the sensory overload seen in autism, or more mild, mild cases, the kind of a, um, um, syndromes like ADHD, attention deficit disorder. <laughs> You can imagine if the high frequencies are too strong or low frequencies too weak, the brain will be overwhelmed and you get sensory overload or you're going to have trouble focusing attention because these, these lower frequency control signals are, are a disadvantage. And we are currently working on um, interventions, non-invasive interventions, so you can rebalance these rhythms and restore normal even, or even improve normal cognitive function. Finally, with my colleague Emery Brown, we're studying how general anesthesia causes loss of consciousness. You may find this disturbing, because anesthesia has been around for 100 years, but medical doctors don't really know why it makes you unconscious. They just know that it works. Okay? And there's been this tacit assumption that anesthesia just kind of turns off your cortex, just silences it. It's not, what your no, 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 it's not how it works, we have discovered. It changes your brainwave dynamics. So here's an example. This is a normal awake brain. These are a bunch of spikes from four different cortical areas. They're, these are the voices of individual neurons in four different cortical areas. And these are called local field potentials. Local field potentials are like the EEG signals you record from the scalp, only these are inside the brain. And what you can see there's a lot of high frequency chatter as different networks are forming and unforming and they're talking to one another and different thoughts are bouncing around the brain. Then we anesthetize the animal using a common anesthetic called propofol. And all this high frequency FM radio chatter is replaced, knocked out, overwhelmed by a low frequency hum that blocks all this chatter and disrupts communication in your cortex. And that's what we think causes unconsciousness. And we are using these studies to develop safer methods of delivering anesthesia. So in summary, there has been a paradigm shift in the past 20 odd years or so uh, from a clockwork-like view of the brain, where we focus on individual parts and single functions, to a more integrated understanding of network dynamics and emergent properties. So we say the 21st century is the, is, the, is the century of emergent properties of the brain. This shift has gone hand in hand with changes in how we study the brain. We used to, the work used to be much more piecemeal. Our understanding of the brain used to be focused on one part at a time. And different approaches focused on different parts, often in different academic departments with very little crosstalk. We all worked in our own way. Now, cross-disciplinary work at multiple levels is where all the excitement is at. And the Picker Institute was way ahead of this. Susumu had the insight to 
study the brain in this integrated, multi-level cross-disciplinary way before anybody else ha had the idea. And the Pick Institute, I think, led the way in this and helped bring about this change in, in, in modern neuroscience. So we continue to push boundaries at the cutting edge of neuroscience. And we do so thanks to great colleagues, students, and postdocs, but also thanks to the generous support of Barbara and Jeffrey Pickauer. Because you can't do cutting edge paradigm shifting science by relying on traditional funding sources. Traditional funding sources are conservative. They want to fund safe bets. But if you want to push the envelope, introduce new ideas, it's important to have the kind of support where you, where you can uh, do not rely on, on these traditional conservative um, 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 judgments. So we, uh, we've been able to do this groundbreaking work because we've had the support from the, Pickauer, from the JPP Foundation to make this work happen. So I thank Barbara and Jeffrey Pickauer, I thank Susumu, and I thank all my colleagues and students who I've had the pleasure with working with in the past 20 years. Thank you. <laughs>